Begum of the Ramit Khan is on her way and she'll be here in a moment. Uh, Chief Guest, Mr. Taj Aziz, keynote speaker, Dr. Ulam Matwar, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a matter of great pleasure for us that uh, Begum of the Ramit Khan has kindly taken the trouble to be present amongst us this morning. She'll be here in a moment. I feel great pleasure an honor in extending a very warm welcome to Professor Ghulam Matwar, who had come all the way from the United States at his own cost to deliver the Akhtar Hamid Khan Centennial Birthday Celebration Lecture. We are really grateful. We could not have been more fortunate in having a chief guest than Mr. Sathar Aziz. My association with him dates back nearly three decades when he first came from Rome to visit AKRSP, where he was Vice President of IFAD. In him, I have found a true believer in social mobilization and his support to rural support programs has not wavered. I only wish there were some more ministers and advisors like him in government. I'm especially grateful to Rector Nast Engineer Mahmoud Azgar and Pro-Rector Irfan Akhtar for hosting the lecture and sincerely taking up the concept of establishing a school of social sciences to widely disseminate the valuable legacy left by Akhtar Hamid Khan countrywide. When I look back on my 83 years of life, including over 61 years of working life. I find it a bundle of coincidences, and one of the most far-reaching coincidences was my chance meeting in 1959 with Dr. Hamid Khan in the Green Arrow train, which used to ply between Chittagong and Dhaka. I was Assistant Commissioner of Brahman Barya, a subdivision of Kumila District, in the then East Pakistan, and Khan Sahab was the director of the newly established Pakistan Academy for Rural Development in Mahatma Gandhi's Abhoya Ashram at the district headquarters. Khan Sahab chose my subdivision as the field orientation area for the Academy's newly inducted faculty holding PhD degrees from the American universities. When Khan Sahib succeeded in persuading his erstwhile colleagues in the ICS, Indian Civil Service, as you know, it was the steel framework of the British Empire. His colleagues used to call him a fool, but a good fool. And they agreed to revamp the Colonial Law and Order Administration into a development administration on his advice. Khan Sahib requested the Provincial Chief Secretary to lend my services to the Academy for a fortnight to help in drawing up a training course for the civil servants chosen to man the newly created post of additional Deputy Commissioner's development in each district. It was the most rewarding experience for me to have spent those days under his tutelage in 1961, although I was transferred to West Pakistan, having completed my tenure in the Eastern Wing, but Khan Sahib remained in my thoughts all the time. In 1972, when I got myself appointed to Pakistan Academy for Rural Development, Peshawar, I persuaded Khan Sahib to visit me before going to Michigan State University where he had been invited to take up a job as a professor, having got displaced from Kumila in the wake of separation of the Eastern Wing.
बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका इतनी तकलीफ की आपने शुक्रिया I was trying to replicate the Kumila model in Daud Zai, an adjoining thana to the Peshawar Academy, and I invited Khan Sahab to visit us before going to Michigan. Khan Sahab looked at it and sent me a note after his visit saying, "Daud Zai is an island of sincerity in the sea of hypocrisy, and keep on sending me your monthly progress reports." i would be deeply interested in its progress a year later when i sent him an invitation to participate in an international seminar in the academy in the academy for organizing about rural development his typical response was to rubbish the idea of coming for a week and dubbed it wastage of money and time and offered to come as advisor to the academy <coughs> on condition that he will not accept more than 1500 rupees i was thrilled i accepted his terms except that i persuaded him that since my salary was 2100 rupees he should accept that that was a prospered then wfp the then wfp government got a province wide the application of daud zai model approved by the federal economic committee of the cabinet this attracted jealousy and on trumped up charges against the academy of subversion because under the program large scale mobilization of rural people were being undertaken <clears throat> and both khan saab and i were thrown out of the academy and my dream of province wide replication and reduction of poverty in the present kp came to naught khansab returned to michigan i sought refuge under united nations umbrella however god willed otherwise and in 1982 i was asked by the aga khan foundation geneva to initiate aga khan rural support program in gilgit baltistan and chitral To my good fortune, Khan Sahab had also returned to Karachi and initiated the world-famous urban slum development program, the Orangi Pilot Project. I was also told by the director of special programs, Aga Khan Foundation, Robert Shaw, that it was Khan Sahab who had suggested to him to secure my services from UNICEF, with whom I was working in Sri Lanka. my tutelage in khan sahab which had come to an abrupt end recommenced with khan sahab paying regular visits to akrsp during my 12 years tenure there and wrote 12 reports of his visits which became the main guideline for implementing akrsp with the establishment of the rural support program khan sahab agreed not only to become a director but also paid frequent visits thus i had the good fortune and benefit of khan sahab's advice and mentoring from 1959 to 1999 the good 40 years sadly for all of us he left this world in 1999 i had always looked upon akhtar amit khan as my mentor and teacher my relationship with him was truly of a sage and a disciple His presence was overpowering and commanding, a, res- a respect not out of fear, but intellectual superiority of a level which belies any description. I feel like a pygmy trying to describe a giant. It was like uh, Boswell, who used to write about Dr. Johnson. <laughs> I can at best be a biographer or a historian recounting my association with the great man but to capture his innate qualities his intellect his vision his depth of knowledge his scholarship his understanding of the religions of the world his sufi streak his buddhist way of life his understanding of islam and the quran his academic work his poetic muse his love for his family and above all 
his mission to help the suffering humanity, and his passion to benefit his countrymen by his experience is beyond my capabilities. I have captured only a few facets of a personality which was so versatile and complete that in the words of Shakespeare, that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Dr. Amit Khan was a complete human being his motto was simple living and high thinking. When I asked him why did he resign from the ICS, unlike the general impression that he resigned in protest against the policies of the colonial regime, his answer was typical of his personality. He said he had learned a great deal from the British and he realized they had nothing more to offer him. The British were masters of good administration, of establishing Pax Britannica, but they had not much to offer to alleviate the sufferings of impoverished humanity. To understand the problems of the poor, Akhtar Hamid Khan decided to quit the prestigious civil service and become a laborer. And he started making locks in Aligarh with a locksmith. However, one day he realized that God had not created him to be a laborer. He therefore decided to join the Jama Millia in Delhi, where Dr. Zakir Hussain, the future president of India, was the head of the institution. But Dr. Ramit Khan was disillusioned somewhat in the same manner as with Allama Mashrafi. Dr. Ramit Khan was a pacifist. He was a follower of Buddha's teachings of peace, not war. He did not subscribe to German philosopher Nietzsche's heroes. He was a man of peace. He used to despair at hero worship in Pakistan. Sometimes he used to compare contemporary Pakistan to Ranjit Singh's regime when the Khalsa army used to boast to fly their flag on the Red Fort. The Maharaja used to beg his generals by putting his turban on their feet to desist from adventurism and never to take on the British army. Immediately on Ranjit Singh's death, the chauvinistic Khalsa engaged the British and lost the Sikh kingdom. During his visits to a KRSP, he used to spend hours with the field staff and the activists and get to the bottom of the rural situation. Every time I accompanied him, I used to learn something new. He was literally a walking encyclopedia. His knowledge was fathomless. When on his visit to Sri Lanka, where I was and I had invited him, he asked me to take, to take him to a Buddhist monastery to meet a monk. He surprised everyone there by reciting Dhammapadda, the Buddhist Quran, in original Pali, which monks could not understand because they had not <laughs> learnt it. They had only learned the translation in Sinhalese. He used to caution me never to go to the original source in matters of religion. He would caution you would be in a shock what interpreters have made of the original. And any challenge to their interpretation would be fought tooth and nail, forcing you to retreat for the sake of your own skin. He was greatly influenced by Buddha's teachings and often used to call himself a Buddhist Muslim. He would have chosen Buddha's way and got rid of the worldly desires. But he said, I love my family too much. I cannot leave them. But in adversity, he would always seek solace in Buddha's saying, this world is full of dukkha. I tried after Hamidha interested in National Rural Support Program initially he was very skeptical of my having accepted an endowment of rupees 500 million from government for an RSP, which Mr. Sataj Aziz persuaded Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif to give. He had reached the conclusion that in Pakistan there was no government and no governance. He used to quote Dante's hell as equivalent of Pakistan government, which had these words inscribed on the gate all that he enter give up hope. With some reluctance, he agreed to visit an RSP regularly and encouraged us by saying, an RSP is a great national asset. 
It is our last hope. I also tell you, yours is no easy job. His apprehensions about the danger of supping with government came to the fore when the successor government to Sardaj's government wanted that I return the 500 million rupees given to it as, I w as if I was a blue-eyed boy of Mr. Nawaz Sharif. Fortunately, on Akhtar Hamid Khan's advice, the money had already been converted into an endowment and when government demanded that all the directors should resign and liquidate the company, Akhtar Hamid Khan, one of the directors, reminded the board of its moral responsibility to an RSP's clientele. At that time, 100,000. Now there are 5.2 million rural households and staff and carried the day against the liquidation of an RSP. Once when I asked him, do I have to wear khadr like him to do the work he was doing, retarded, you don't have to become a barupia. Don't insult the intelligence of the people. They will recognize your true worth in any garb. In northern areas, he used to remind me that your western dress or hat or travel by helicopter has made no difference in poor people recognizing your real worth. My coming away from a KRSP greatly saddened him that another opportunity to develop a self-reliant model for Pakistan was lost. I terribly missed the regular contact I used to have with him in a KRSP. He concentrated more and more on urban development. And when I would complain to him, seeking all the support from Begum Akhtar Hamid Khan, he chided me for not concentrating on developing and replicating models of home instead of running abroad all the time. He was most solicitous about my health and sometimes would innocent ask me, do you really need to earn so much money? I used to say that you are an exploiter. If you can live in 5,000 rupees, you think that everybody can do that. People also have families. And I said, I'm not earning money for myself. I really want to give the best to my family. He had already seen me living in a small room without modern amenities in the elephant country in Mahavali forest of Sri Lanka or in a small apartment in Gilgit for 15 years. Anyway, I was happy that he had started finding new disciples and the complaint he made in 1983 in the following speech was no more true. And I quote his speech and this should might interest the students here also. He says, nowadays there is a curious reluctance, especially among the younger generation, to understand and learn. Everyone seems to think he is a master. It is strange, because masters are not born. What my sneering friends dismissed as my charisma was an acquired skill, a skill acquired after a long period of apprenticeship under the British Gandhian and American masters, a skill further sharpened by the study of many successful models in other countries, Germany, Japan, Taiwan, Yugoslavia, China, India, and Israel. I never felt ashamed of my long and multiple discipleship. I never pretended to be an original thinker. I thought I could teach after I had devoted much time and labor by learning from many sources. When I was young, I accepted the wise advice of Khwaja Hafiz, which was that there are Sadat Mand students and the Piridana, you can teach them a lot. And I continued. As I grew old, I began to think perhaps wrongly that I have not grown old in vain, that throughout my long life, I have been a good student Therefore, in my old age, I could be a good teacher. In my delusion, I thought that at least I too would become a Piradana, a wise old man, and I could give guidance to Javana and Sadat Man, enlightened young men. <coughs> Alas, in 20 years, only one enlightened young Sheikh Sultan Khan cherished me as a worthy teacher. He applied my methods 
First with Dawood Zahi, of course with necessary modifications, and then in Mahavali in Sri Lanka, and now he's applying them with the further refinement and thoroughness in Gilgit. He has definitely disproved the obscurantist charisma theory. Is it my fault that I found only one enlightened young man? I think that was the time when he was very disappointed. But he did find many enlightened men because despite his modesty, the fact is that more than four of his disciples got Max Heise Award, also known as Asia's Nobel Prize. Two of them came from Pakistan, myself and Tasneem Siddiqui, and two from Bangladesh, and many more perhaps from Bangladesh. A record in the, which is a rec record in the history of Max Heise Award Foundation, AHK got the award in 1963. He was disturbed at dependence on foreign experts, saying, as I look back, I realize that there is one main feature in Pakistan which is very disturbing, the failure of governance. Things which were done competently in the colonial past are neglected. Let me give you an example in the Punjab. The world's largest irrigation network was built by Indian experts. The chief engineer might have been an Englishman, but he had worked in India for 20 to 30 years. He was not a London-based consultant, but an Indian officer, and all his assistants were Indians. Despite the gloom and well the country, Akhtar Hamid Khan always could see the brighter side. He spoke of the resilience and success of the informal sector. He used to challenge anyone to find a beggar in Orangi. He had great faith in people, in their willingness to do things themselves, to improve their situation. All they need, according to him, were support organizations and level playing field. He used to say, and I quote, in Pakistan, development will not come from the top, it will come from the bottom, and it shall happen in pockets. One island formed here, one island there, and one island will be made by you. Dr. Amit Khan was the very epitome of the principle of simple living and high thinking. In his non-rural development garb, his humility and generosity as a man was amazing. His rapport with the rustic, the non-genteel, the labor, the lower government functionaries and the like was inimitable. He was absolutely at ease with them as much as he was uncomfortable with the pseudo-intellectuals and experts. He neither knew evil nor nor could perceive evil, and thus, in judging people, was very gullible. He was often led astray by such unscrupulous persons, leaving him hurt and confused. He had no cunning and accepted everything on its face value. Why such a man with an open, forthright, honest, and simple person should have been ever misunderstood is something beyond me. Trumped up cases of the Blasphemy were instituted against him. When I got an opportunity at a dinner hosted by the Prime Minister, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, I spoke to him about the injustice of Dr. Hamid Khan. He agreed to see him, and his secretary, Qazi Ali Mullah, arranged the meeting. The Prime Minister listened to Dr. Hamid Khan for nearly an hour, but I knew from his expression that he was not listening because Dr. Ramit Khan only spoke of development and did not realize he had gone to talk to him about his blasphemy cases. After the meeting, Dr. Ramit Khan observed the Prime Minister did not understand what he was saying. I said, well, it's not his fault. Why didn't you speak about your blasphemy case? He was told that you had come to talk to, talk to him about it. He replied, do you know, when Munaym Khan, governor of East Pakistan, used to complain against me to President Ayub, the latter used to brush away all complaints by retorting, Akhtar Hamid Khan is the only person in Pakistan who never comes to me for any personal favor. Anyway, the Prime Minister did order withdrawal of the cases against Akhtar Hamid Khan. The request of the government was accepted by the government of Sindh in Karachi, which was accepted by the presiding judge and the case was allowed to be withdrawn. 
However, the case registered in Multan was not allowed to be withdrawn by the court despite Punjab government's request and remained pending till his death. Dr. Ramit Khan passed away in the United States where he was visiting his beloved daughter and I'm glad Aisha, a full-fledged MD doctor, <laughs> is here. President General Parvez Musharraf posthumously honored Dr. Ramit Khan by conferring Nishan Imtiaz. In conclusion, I will repeat what I have often said. In all my travels throughout the world, I have never come across a person of the stature of Dr. Ramit Khan. I sometimes wonder, did Pakistan really make the best use of the unique experience with which he was so willing and keen to benefit his countrymen and women? But now it's too late even to ask this question. The country has missed an opportunity of a century. Thank you.